Well, welcome everyone. We are so glad you're here. Welcome to everyone that is new. If you are just join us, joining us, you can see that um, the, uh, the chat window is getting a lot of action right now. We have um, been asking people to type in where they're from and if it's raining or sunny, um, if it's their first webinar in the chat window. Um, my name is Nancy Hafer. I'm with the Northern California Training Academy, and um, I've uh, met many of you and haven't met any many of you and look forward to um, spending this time with you. And we just got, it's snowing in Denver, Krista. Ooh, wow. Snow is in Denver. It's um, my hometown, Colorado Springs, they're, you're on the call and it's snowing there too. <laughs> um, cool. Um, so, uh, I, um, uh, am going to introduce Amanda. <laughs> I'm Amanda Littlefield. I'm with the Northern California Training Academy as well. And just happy to be here. Great. I'm handling, I'm helping with the technical side of things. Great. Um, so we are, um, really excited about this webinar. Um, and Lori, you've got the control. Do you want to, um, click on to the next slide yes. for us, please? Uh-oh. That right? There we go. So um, I'm uh, Nancy Hafer again. I'm an academic coordinator here at the Northern California Training Academy and have done a lot of work with integrating coaching into, in particular, um, child welfare over the last um, probably 10, 11 years and uh, have really um, been fortunate to be able to work with some um, really just smart and fabulous people all over the country who are also working on um, integrating and trying to figure out how to integrate coaching into all aspects of not only child welfare, but human services. So coaching for frontline workers all the way up through leadership, and then also coaching um, the children and families that we work with. Um, and uh, really excited to um, say that we've got to announce that we have Lori here. And Lori, do you want to introduce yourself and say a little bit about you? Yeah, yeah. Hello, everyone from across the U.S. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. I, um, th th there's really no population I would rather be hanging out with on this Thursday afternoon than human people working in the human services field, um, helping to make a difference in the lives of our most vulnerable population. So thank you so much. And um, I share, I, I think, some background with some of you. I've worked as a clinician. I've worked in the child welfare, juvenile justice, behavioral health system. And boy, my goodness, is that some... Um, some tough work. So the fact that you've carved out this 90 minutes, hopefully you can be here the whole time to um, focus on your personal growth and development is really beautiful and fantastic. Um, now I, I, I kind of travel around the world. I'm a coach. I do personal and executive team coaching. And um, I take kind of a neuroscience, or I actually call a neurosomatic approach, which is what we're going to do today. So we get a little taste of what I mean by that. Um, really helping people look at the biology of how we facilitate positive change, whether it's at the individual level, team, organization, or the entire system. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, we're really um, excited about our partnership with Lori. We uh, were fortunate to attend a training where Lori was one of the keynote speakers in October. And because we work for a training organization, we said, well, we, we want her <laughs> to come work with us. So um, we have really um, valued some of the work, uh, uh, all of the work that so far you've done for us, Lori, but we've really valued this partnership and are, are glad to bring you on board to, to share some of this information. Um, so yay, this is going to be a, a great webinar. Um, so can you click on to the next slide? Oh yeah, I should be mo mo moving a little faster here. Sorry. No, that's totally not at all. Um, and then click on to the next one. Um, and we've got a question if you guys will be able to print out the slides. Um, I'll talk to Lori about that, about printing out slides, but the webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to um, watch the, the um, webinar again. We typically have not sent out the PowerPoints because we're recording them, but um, you can let us know if that's something that you'd, if you'd really like some of the slides, then I'm sure we can work something out. Um, so the Northern California Training Academy, for those of you who aren't familiar, we serve 28 counties in Northern California. Um, and we train on a variety of topics um, for child welfare, anything from safety organized practice to trauma informed um, services, and then of course coaching. And we've done a fair amount of coaching over the last, um, like I said, 10 years. 
Um, we are, and Lori's going to go to the next slide, um, really excited um, to announce that we've got um, our next um, uh, national conference on coaching and human services will be held on May 5th and 6th in the year 2020, which is still going to take some time for me to say 2020. Um, but in 2020, in May, uh, we will be here in Davis. Um, for our next national conference on coaching, our request, our, our um, if you'd like to host a workshop, we are um, going to release our request for proposals um, probably within the next couple of months. If you'd like to present a workshop, we're really excited to see what everybody across the country is doing in coaching and human services. So watch out, save the date. Um, it's soon to be coming. Um, we This is just a list of all of the classes that we teach um, in the North State um, on coaching. Um, and we've gotten actually the honor to work with several different states um, across the nation on some of these classes. So we, we, we teach a, quite a bit of different kinds of coaching classes and um, we are just continuing to learn and grow in our own thinking about coaching. And we offer this webinar series to all of you um, uh, as a way to help both um, inspire the just inspire the continued learning ours and yours about coaching um, and human services. This is our fourth um, webinar, our last and um, final webinar. I will be on. I every time I say, oh my gosh, I have to put this in the webinar and the, the slides, and I forget every single time. I think it's on June fifth, and it will be um, uh, in partnership with the Child Welfare League of America, uh, and will be um, on connecting the dots between supervision and coaching and human services that we're really excited for. So um, I think that's it from us. Lori, you can take it from here. All right. I'm going to just um, we'll get started here. I'm going to drop down. And we're going to stop our video. Yeah, just so I'm not a distractor. Okay, good deal. <clears throat> All right, I think, did we already check in and did, do we want folks to tell us, do you have a poll here, Nancy? Right, yes, so please tell us um, who you are. I've got a poll for um, your job. So please use um, the polling. You can see it should just have popped up on your screen. Um, and while you're answering this, um, it, uh, we, we now have 104 people who have signed on. So as you're joining, um, we are going to have a couple of different ways for you to communicate with us. We're going to um, practice some of them out right now, but we've got some polling questions, the chat box, um, and then also a Q&A, which we will um, um, be practicing in just a minute. Okay, so we've got 74 out of 104 people have answered so far. Um, and I'm going to share results. It looks like the vast majority are social, well, you can see social workers and case managers, um, a fair amount of leadership. And we have one probation officer. Everybody give them a round of applause. Yay, one probation <laughs> officer is on the line. <coughs> Excellent. And then I have another question here for you which is, um, where do you work? I love this, getting this information about the community here. This is great. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, if people are still answering, looks like it's starting to slow down. Got. Two more seconds to register and I'm gonna end polling and share the results with everyone. Okay, so we've got um, a majority child welfare and then a lot of others. So if you um, wrote in other, type in the chat box, with, what does other mean to you? We've got some trainer coaches, behavioral health, good. R&R, oh, &R, I'm not sure what R&R &R means. Tribal TANF, excellent. Workforce Development, Care Source, Home Visitor. Excellent, wonderful, wonderful. Glad you all are here today. And then, oh, did I share the results? I did, right? I did, um, yeah. yeah. Okay, and then our last poll question is, um, where are you physically on the planet right now? 
And while you're filling that out, we can see that there's, um, oh, resource and referral. Thank you for writing that. Um, practice coaches, tribal family services. Wonderful, wonderful. Oh, okay. So Alex, you were great. So um, it, it seems like right now, everybody is um, chatting to all panelists, which means that not everybody can see all panelists and attendees. So um, I just wrote texted out all panelists and attendees. And now it looks like everybody can see I'm so glad Alex that you pointed that out. I thought everybody could see. So if you are chatting to us, Please um, make sure that you're you're chatting to all part all panelists and attendees if you would like everybody to see your responses. So thank you for doing that. Um, okay, and then sorry, I'm gonna stop talking. So um, Laura, you can take this. We've got lots of people from the West Coast, um, a couple people from the South and the Northeast. And Lori, how about if you take it away? Yeah, absolutely. Glad to see that <clears throat> there's 10% of us on the East Coast here <laughs> on a totally different time zone. It's afternoon out here. Um, so welcome, everybody. I just wanted this is just a high level overview of um, what we're going to be covering in this webinar today. It is really jam packed. It's chocked full. A lot of science. I do want to emphasize I'm going to be integrating findings from the field of contemporary neuroscience, psychophysiology, even neurocardiology, as well as coaching and kind of synthesizing some of the nuggets from these fields and what they have to do with cultivating stress resilience. So we're really taking stress resilience, not from a trait or a personality perspective, which is kind of a traditional approach but from an integrative kind of neurosomatic lens of a brain body lens. So what's happening in our physiology and how do we shift our state, our physiology so that we can become more stress resilient. And then what does that look like with the clients that we serve as well? So I have a question and I think we're gonna take a poll on this one too, Nancy. Um, and maybe just one or two words. It doesn't have to be lengthy. So succinctly, how would you define resilience? And you can use your Q&A box for this. Um, so if you go up to your Q&A box or you can use the chat, but if you do the chat, then please do it for all, all um, attendees too. Great, thank you, Nancy. Maybe you could think about somebody you know that you think is resilient. What have they demonstrated? What do, what does it look like when people are resilient or just like basic definition? Maybe you're in an elevator on the 12th floor and you have to define resilience to everybody in there by the time you get down. <laughs> How would you, what would you say? Okay, so Lori, we've got, um, should I start reading them off for you? Yeah, that'd be fantastic. We've got adjusting to change easily, bouncing forward, ability to get back up after difficulty, getting through tough times, bounce back from difficult situations, surviving through trauma, just keep on swimming. Go oh, um, wow. I love the metaphor. Coming in, overcoming hardship, inner wisdom, and keeping yourself safe and cared for. Ooh, yeah. Calm and chaos. Really good. Yeah, bouncing forward. That's pretty interesting. Um, and I heard I heard the theme and I think I heard a couple of bouncing backs there. Um, that is really, I mean, you could have like opened up a, a, a textbook, um, especially from, uh, I mean, even now, any textbook, but definitely from 10, 20 years ago. And that really was the classic definition is, is how do we bounce back? Um, or even, you know, I like the bounce forward. Um, really facing challenge, adversity, and stress in our lives. And then when it hits us, how do we just pop back up when we have those experiences? And what we've learned from the research really in the past like 10, 15 years is that the definition of resilience is expanding. It's no longer just about bouncing back. And, and actually, I, I do a lot of um, resilience training across the country. And one of my goals is for people to bounce back a little bit less than they already do. Uh, the bouncing back is, 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 is a critical skill and we need to do it and it's great, but it can take a toll on us after a while. There's some wear and tear that comes from bouncing back. 
But what happens when we have the capacity to prepare for, recover from, which would be bouncing back, and adapt in the face of stress, adversity, trauma, or challenge? So I hope that you see some differences in this definition. It should, the, everything that you guys said was absolutely 100% on point, but I'm just adding a little bit more to how we see it. So we don't want to just have to bounce back. We want how do we flex and adapt in the moment? Um, how are we prepared for? I kind of think of like Navy SEALs. If Navy SEALs had to bounce back all the time, it, it, it wouldn't work out so well for some of the missions that they have to um, that they have to go out and implement. Another word here that I really want you to hone in on here is capacity. We often think of stress resilience as being like a personality trait. Like that person's really gritty, they're perseverant, they're optimistic, they you know hang in there in the face of challenge and adversity. And really we're all born wired for that. Um, it's a little less about the personality trait and it actually has a lot to do with what's going on with us biologically. So if we think about the term capacity, I want you to think about like capacity, like think, you think of like a battery, like how much your battery and we, a, whole, a battery holds. So you can see here in this image that there's a lot of capacity on the far left there. The battery is charged. That's what we like our cell phones and our computers to look like or our iPads. On the right, not too much capacity. So you may have noticed that there's times when um, you get up in the morning and maybe you're stuck in traffic, you're late for a meeting, but you're like, hey, I'll, I'll make a phone call to my family. I'll use this time for that. Um, it'll be okay. Like you're just a little more relaxed. It's not so, it doesn't bump up against an edge for you so bad. And then you even get a call from a client, you know, and they've slipped on their plan or what, you know, whatever, whatever's going on, or you've got an important meeting that you're, you might miss, but you're able, you've, you've, you're kind of on the, towards the left there. You've, you've got enough capacity to where like energy where you can manage it and it doesn't take you down. But then there's other mornings when the very same thing could happen and we're on the right side. <laughs> and we really don't have that resilience capacity to respond to the demands of the moment. And the more we're on the right side, the more bouncing back we're gonna have to do and the harder it is. Sometimes it can take you know, weeks, months, years, lifetimes to bounce back. And of course we see this um, with our uh, families that are coming into the system needing support they've often been depleted for far too long. So their inner battery has either been flickering or it's really in a state of depletion. So we have to look at not, you know, just what's going on with their battery, but ours as well. So we're really energy systems um, as human beings. And, and some of you may think, well, that's kind of energy systems. Like what's that got to do, you know, with resiliency? That sounds a little woo woo, or, you know, maybe that's a new agey thing, or I, you know, I don't know what might be going on through your mind, but I mean, scientifically here, literally at like the physiological level, we are energy. So I think it's around 10 o'clock your time around noon or one o'clock or whatever time you eat lunch today you're going to convert that food into energy. And that's really a, a pretty invisible process, that energy that's going on in your body. So that's called ATP, which is actually like the energy in, our, in the human body. We have little cells in there that are like our energy currency. Those have a lot to do with how resilient you are or your client is. So what are we talking about here? Fuel efficiency. How intelligent are we managing ourselves as an energy system? I apologize, I'm in the DC metro area. You may be hearing some sirens going off in the background. Um, so how are we, are, are we managing ourselves as an energy system with intelligence, with at least as much intelligence and wisdom as we do our cell phones and our computers? One of the best ways that we can recharge our batteries uh, is sleep. 
that's there's lots of examples, but that's one. If we're not plugging in in the evenings, we know that the next day we wake up with less resilience capacity to be able to handle the challenges that come our way. We're going to talk a little bit about what's going on in the physiology when we act, don't have that energy, that resilience capacity to respond to the demands, what's happening in our brains and then what's happening in our bodies as well. What can happen is these, if we're, ta if we're experiencing one energy drain after another, and we're not plugging in, it's just like our phone. If you, I know I travel a lot, I'm in airports a lot, and all of a sudden I'll catch myself, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm about to get on the plane in a three hour flight and I've got my batteries going down and I'm gonna have to catch an Uber when I get to where I'm going. Um, we're very much the same, and that's not metaphorical, that's actually very scientifically measurable and literal that we're like that. <clears throat> and this starts when we don't experience renewal, just like we would with our cell phone, this starts taking a big toll on health, well-being, and decision-making. And of course, people that are facing challenging circumstances in their lives, and perhaps decision-making has been, you know, not the best, has been impaired, this is part of the reason why. So they're coming into a system to really learn um, how to replenish, renew this energy so that they can access the part of their intelligence to help them to make better decisions. So there's really kind of four <clears throat> key areas or domains, if you will, where we can expend energy or we can renew energy. So these are the domains of resilience. How would we build resilience capacity? Think of how much resilience you can hold, like a tank, in the physical domain. Well, we would kind of we would start going to the gym and doing bicep curls, or you know whatever it might be. If we were a runner and we could run two miles per day, and we wanted to do a marathon, we would have to shift our baseline. We would have to start slowly increasing to three miles a day, four miles a day, and get ourselves up to 26. We would shift our baseline from I can run two miles to I can run 26 miles. That means you just increased your resilience capacity in the physical domain. That means in any given cir circumstance, you are going to be more prepared for, able to adapt in, and recover from anything that's physically demanding. It goes the same for the emotional domain being flexible, what like being able to have a positive outlook. This is all about self-regulation. You know, what might take a toll, some type of a stressor that causes frustration, worry, anger, anxiety, that's gonna deplete you. Something that is going to um, enhance or increase resilience capacity is experiencing feelings, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about the science of these, but experiencing feelings such as compassion, uh, care, um, did you accidentally summon me? Oops. Uh, my Siri just went off on my phone for some reason, which is so funny. Oh, it's sitting over beside me. So that's, that's what you heard with Siri in the background. So back to the emotional domain, we can have depletion or renewal in this domain. Same as spiritual. Are we able to tolerate other people's perspectives and viewpoints? Can we keep what we do, our behaviors and our actions in line with our most important values? That's the prescription for happiness. Mental domain, what depletes that? One meeting after another in the workplace, we're gonna get depletion in that, which is why sometimes when we get home, we're just really ready for a big piece of chocolate cake or maybe a glass of wine because we've just been in mental depletion all day. How do we increase this? You know, uh, maybe something like mindfulness practice is going to help, you know, with, uh, with being able to focus. So getting some renewal in the mental domain, or there's lots of other ways where you can renew. There is one of these domains where we experience profoundly so the biggest drain on our resilience capacity. And I hey, guess- Hey, Lori. Hey, yes. Lori. I'm going to interrupt you. It sounds like a couple people lost audio. Um, okay. So I want to check. We can still hear you. So I just want to see if it's back. Melissa and Melody. Yeah, you bet. That, they lost mm -hmm. the audio. Um, uh, Melissa, can you hear us again? Okay, great. So, um, and, and then um, there is 
if, if for some reason you lose us, there's two options, either your computer audio or the dial-in audio option, which somebody was gracious enough to um, put in the chat window box. Um, so if you lose your computer audio, you can chat us and we'll send you the, um, the phone number. Okay. Maybe it, maybe it was Siri. <laughs> You know, I always. <laughs> oh, I was on mute, but I was laughing with you, Lori. That was funny. Okay. Yeah, I see. she was really loud. I I don't even know if I've ever heard my phone do that. That was so. I always call those like those are little glitches in the matrix. <laughs> that was so funny. It yeah. was funny. Okay, okay, back to you. All right, I'm glad that was um, short, and we got everybody back on track. Fantastic. So we're we're either expending or renewing energy in these domains at any given point in time. And of course they obviously overlap. So I live in DC area. I deal with the Beltway, the 495 for all, for you guys around here know what I'm talking about. Here's an example. I could be going to a, a meeting, a very important meeting with a client. I'm in traffic and I'm gonna be 30 minutes late. I'm gonna experience frustration, anger, anxiety, worry, whatever that emotion might be. There's a depletion right there. And so I start feeling that anger, frustration, anxiety. I get to the meeting with my client. Perhaps I have a difficult time um, in the mental domain. I experience another depletion. I can't focus. And then they start sharing something with me and I have a hard time really even seeing their perspective. So I'm getting a hit in the spiritual domain, not doing too well there either. And then by, after I leave the meeting, I've got like a headache because my shoulders have been tense the whole time while I was driving. So all these are really interconnected and impacting our resilience capacity at even, any given point. But the literature is very clear that the emotional domain of resilience is where the biggest hole is. And it's a gaping hole. <laughs> We're losing a lot of energy and this is connected to our resilience, our decision making, our ability, you know, just to make good choices, to collaborate in a child and family team meeting, to hear other people's perspective, to follow a care plan when we have this kind of a drain. Um, even, and this is very scientific, I, I really want to emphasize that, that this is measurable. So for example, Candace Pert at the National Institutes of Health discovered, she wrote a great book um, called The Molecules of Emotion I, that I recommend, um, that we actually literally have, when we have an emotional experience, which is very frequent, we have um, like what's called neuropeptides. And these are like messenger molecules. So we have this emotional experience, which is kind of like invisible. And then it sends these neuropeptides down to the body and it activates like, like a biochemical reaction. And then those emotions become things in the body. Hence the level of chronic illness that we have in our society. So we now know that the, the connection, the communication with the emotions, which is invisible energy, is becoming matter, physical matter in the body. It's changing our, how our organs function. I mean, you know this if you've ever had butterflies in your stomach and you know maybe some digestive issues after that. So it literally is changing things at a physiological level. Well, what's coaching got to do with this? Well, let's take a look at that. Let's see if we can take a look at what would coaching have to do with we have all of these drains in the emotional domain. Well, we're helping people to cultivate stress resilience capacity in the emotional domain in the human services industry. And we're doing this with the people who come in that are facing challenging circumstances. We're doing with the workforce that's helping people that are facing challenging circumstances and trying to create a life that they, would pre that they prefer to have. And then we're doing this throughout the system and cross systemically as well between different child and, serving, child and family serving agencies. So here's the definition um, of coaching, especially uh, this is really particular to the context of human services. It's a human development. I mean, really that's what we're doing guys. We're doing human development, which has everything to do with resiliency. It's a human development process that involves structured, focused interaction and the use of strategies, appropriate strategies, tools, and techniques. You can see this is very deliberate to promote desirable and sustainable change, not just a one-shot change, but ongoing change for the benefit of the learner, which might be the client or a direct report, 
and other stakeholders as well. This says potentially other stakeholders, but I would, I would, I would venture to say always other stakeholders, not to go against this definition, but it's going everybody is interconnected here. So what we're talking about here are very deliberate and specific conversations that foster deeper levels of engagement, commitment to action, so new ways of thinking, feeling, and doing, and shared accountability. There's like everybody involved in a coaching conversation has, a, has some part, some piece in the accountability process. These conversations, a coaching engagement, really aims to enhance self-awareness, we're building capacities, self-esteem, confidence, and ultimately just overall in improving human performance and levels of resilience. Because most of what we're doing is, um, is really cultivating, I mean, you're going to keep me here, hear me keep saying that, cultivating that resilience capacity. We're shifting the baseline in the emotional resilience domain. Just like you could shift the baseline in the physical resilience domain by going to the gym and increasing your bicep curls and your weight, you would get stronger. That's what we want in the emotional domain. And as, as a human services industry, that's, that's the primary area, that in mental. Well, how does coaching help with this? One key ingredient in coaching that's super useful, and we'll unpack this a little bit more, for cultivating, really increasing that resilience capacity in the emotional domain, it's just questioning versus telling. And not just any old question. There's a particular kind of question, open-ended questions. I'm sure you guys know this information. Questions that evoke reflection. Questions that cause people to go inward and think about their thinking not us tell them about what their thinking is or how their thinking needs to change, but getting them to be aware with what's happening with me. When people go into a reflective state, this decreases a region of the brain called the limbic system, that emotional center where the amygdala is. That's that old mammalian brain. Sometimes we call it the animal brain. It's the primal region. And just by asking open-ended questions, we cool it off. And I know, you guys know, that when people are coming into the system facing challenging circumstances, their limbic system is aroused. <laughs> um, that's just, the, if we didn't have an aroused limbic system, they probably would, you know, chances are they might be making some different choices in their lives. So what else? How else does coaching fit in? These are just a couple. There's lots of coaching skills. We won't go over all of them. But just the act of clarifying what somebody is saying can actually help to um, get people to re self reflect and to see themselves in new ways. And that's kind of what we're doing. We're creating opportunities for people to see them to rewrite their stories. How do they rewrite their stories? So, you know, we, a clarification might be something like, you know, can I just clarify? You know, I heard you say this. I just want to make sure I'm on track here. That's just basic communication. When we do that, it shows that we care enough about the person. There's a connection that happens there. Just the act of clarifying, which can be really, really powerful in calming down the limbic system and lighting up the prefrontal region of the brain. And we'll talk a little bit more about that region of the brain, although I'm sure many of you are aware of, of the responsibility of that part of our of the human brain when we say to a client um, instead of why do you feel that way or you need to just you do this or telling them what to do when we say something like i can see you're a little apprehensive about the changes tell me more you're excited but i'm also sensing you're a little scared tell me a little bit more about that or how does that sit with you when you hear me say that out loud? Though that, that, that's reflection and that reflection helps the client to see themselves. That's a very, that's a very non-defensive state. So what we're talking about here is, is, what you, is the heart of what you guys are doing. You are rewiring the human brain. And actually, I'd like to rephrase this. In, we're really helping people to rewire their own brains. And that's the beauty of coaching. Coaching is very self-directed. 
although we're heavily involved in that coaching process, you know, we're really mastering that, that conversation and that process. In human services, we're, we're helping them to change the neural circuitry in their brains to create new neural pathways. This is neuroplasticity. The brain is kind of like three, three pounds of plasticity in the skull. We're talking about the brain in the skull right now. There's, we're gonna talk about a different brain later, but the brain in the skull, the cranial brain is three pounds of plasticity. It can be rewired and molded, remolded throughout the entire lifespan, but it requires a new experience. Groundhog Day will not rewire the brain. And in human services, it, what we're doing is creating opportunities for people to see themselves in new ways and to engage in new ways of thinking, feeling, and doing. This is what creates new circuitry and new maps in the brain. And this is important because people see the world through their brain circuitry. If they don't have pathways for it, they can't see it. So if somebody's coming in with an addiction, for example, they've got a lot of brain, I've got a big set of circuitry and brain map mapping for addiction and how that is helping them to relieve their pain. They don't have a lot of wiring in their brain or maps. They've probably got some, but it's not as big for how to relieve their pain in different ways. And so coaching helps them to explore all of those maps and find some that help them to see different ways of handling the pain that they're experiencing. This is called self-directed neuroplasticity. And this is the heart of coaching. In coaching conversations, this is exactly what you are doing, whether it's with a, a, like some, a team member, it could be with a, a, a stakeholder. We can do this up, down, and across the system with families. Coaching conversations really do fit in everywhere. They're, ju they're not just with, the folks coming in, the customers coming in for services. They are with everybody. So in some respects, we're constantly rewiring like the brain of the child welfare system, for example. We're creating new maps everywhere, new pathways, new circuitry, but only by creating those opportunities for people to see themselves differently. This is very different, not to be confused, with telling people what to do or giving them advice. When we do this, even if people beg for it, when we scan their brains with an fMRI, for example, we see that the, there's an error signal that goes off in a region of the brain and they're really kicking back and pushing back. And they, they're getting a nice burst of cortisol when we tell them what to do or we give them advice for complex problems. If somebody needs to know how to um, turn on the printer or use a copy maker, we can tell them what to do. But most those aren't the problems that are keeping us up at night. It's these complex problems where there's all kinds of solutions and we're trying to find the most novel solution. We are all born wired to make our own novel connections. We get a nice burst of dopamine, which is a feel-good neurotransmitter that's involved in learning, instead of cortisol, the stress hormone. Even though somebody might shake their head and say, yes, okay, you know, I, I, I'll do that. Most of the time, cortisol is being released in the system. It's crossing over. It's coming from the adrenal glands. It's crossing over the blood-brain barrier. It's shutting down the human part of the brain, it's lighting up the primal part of, part of the brain. That's not the part of the brain to follow a care plan or to engage in a collaborative conversation. So we're rewiring the brain. Well, there's not just one nervous system. I'll use the example of families, but we could really use this with you know anybody in the system. It's a parallel process throughout a uh, human service system that people have come in and they have been toning their autonomic nervous system in a particular way. And their story, their narrative is in the nervous system. It's in the autonomic nervous system and it's in the brain. The footprints of the whole life narrative are there. So part of the work that we do as, as a human service system is we help to retune the autonomic nervous system.
And by doing this, <clears throat> we help people to get out of status quo. What I mean by that is they no longer respond in a way that used to be very intelligent for them in a context now where it's not very adaptive. So any response that a client gives that it doesn't look like a good one, it was once a good response. It no longer fits the context. They're stuck. And this is stuck. They've been having those messenger molecules from the emotional response go throughout their nervous system. They have a regular neurochemical cocktail, all of us do, that we drink every morning when we get up based on what we're thinking and we're feeling. And we're wiring our nervous system that way. So we want to help them retune that. Coaching is a fantastic approach for retuning the autonomic nervous system because it really helps to, um, to, to calm down the part of the nervous system that puts us in defense. And it opens up the part of our nervous system and our brains that allows us to be curious, open, interested, collaborative. And of course, I know you guys would like to see more of that. So I just want to just briefly here, because I'm, I'm guessing, I know I'm in a um, virtual room of really smart people that probably already have this knowledge, <clears throat> but we'll just do a kind of a high level overview. Three key regions, and this is very rudimentary. The brain is not divided up into these nice little compartments. Everything's really pretty interconnected. But if we take a look at these three areas, they do kind of play key roles. So I'm sure you guys have heard of the prefrontal cortex, the frontal lobe. This is the part of the brain that separates us from lower primates. This is the seat of awareness and self-regulation. If people, if we've made some choices in our lives that aren't very adaptive, this part of the brain was probably inhibited during that process. Um, this is really where grit, perseverance, being able to push through uh, really challenging situations is coming from. So we wanna cultivate, we wanna grow gray matter in this region of the brain. Coaching is one way to help people grow gray matter in this region of the brain. Um, if you look over to the left, so we just, we're talking about a conscious part of the brain, which is only about 3%, the prefrontal cortex of the overall size of the brain. So the part of the brain that's involved, really involved in success in life is very, very tiny, very, very energy intensive. So every time we get one of those emotional depletions, worry, anxiety, um, intolerance, frustration, anger, that is take pulling and taking out um, resources in the frontal lobe every time that happens. So when the limbic system, if we look over here to the left in the limbic system, that's kind of the emotional center of the brain, particularly amygdala. Sometimes I'll, that amygdala is like the guard standing at the door. It's always scanning. What is going to hurt me? What's good? What's bad? And of course we decide what's good and bad depending on what's happened to us. So we see the world through the brain maps that we already have. So we're, we're kind of sorting through the storage system in our brain anytime we get new information and we're deciding the meaning of it. And the limbic system decides in about a fifth of a second, do I move towards something or do I move away from it? And if it decides to move away, the prefrontal cortex, it's like a seesaw effect. It's gonna pull resources. So if we experience an emotion such as frustration or anger, it's pulling resources from that frontal lobe. And what happens is the, what the decision or the choice or the habit that gets implemented comes, straight, comes from the basal ganglia area, which is very fast, very automatic. This is kind of like, like a, a big, a key region in um, habit. So if, um, if you've always done something a certain way, the more that limbic system gets activated and there's a threat response, the more we're actually just gonna go straight to like Groundhog Day how I've always done things. Do you guys see clients doing this sometimes? Yes. Do you see staff doing this sometimes? Yes. That's kind of a signal that you may, that there may be a threat response going on. Safety is, is somehow being impacted in some way. So the big takeaway here is that when that limbic system detects something that's not okay and it moves away, 
it activate, we get cortisol. We've actually got, there's a hypothalamic pituitary axis. We're not gonna talk a lot about that, but the HPA axis gets activated. It goes down to the adrenals. We get the cortisol, cortisol shuts, comes up, crosses the blood brain barrier, shuts down the frontal lobe. So we have to manage this. And we have to teach people how to manage this. So we have to manage it ourselves and we have to teach people how to manage this as well. So how do we, we're probably dealing with situations where people have some, you know, the frontal lobe could use some nurturing, right? Coaching helps nurture that frontal lobe and soothe. It kind of puts a little balm on that flame, that inflamed limbic region. And this is important because that is how the brain develops. It develops through interactions with other people. So the frontal lobe is a process of co-regulation. It's connections with humans that shape the neural connections. So how, whatever neural connections somebody has, that's based on the human connection that they have. This is all happening below conscious awareness. So if you see um, maybe an adolescent that's struggling with impulse control or, or behavioral issues, if you look at their past, they probably weren't, they didn't have the opportunity to spend a lot of time with somebody who had a pretty good frontal lobe in place because we need some, we need to be around somebody else who has a good PFC, a nice healthy PFC. This is why you'll, you've probably heard the literature say that it just takes one person in a child's life and they may not be in the home. That might be you as the case manager. It might be um, a therapist, it could be a coach, um, it could be a teacher, somebody that's bringing a frontal lobe for them to borrow. Well, we, there's adults that come into the system that need to borrow a frontal lobe too. Why, do, why is this important? Because resilience is neural disintegration or integration. Low levels of stress resilience is when the linkage of the differentiated parts in the brain, the prefrontal cortex, the limbic system, other regions of the brain, the left and the front hemisphere, they're not working together in synchrony. They haven't been linked up well. There's a disconnection. The more disconnected and the less integration there is in the nervous system, and this is all throughout the body and the brain, the least amount of self-regulation that we have. So self-regulation could also be defined as the linkage of differentiated parts and coaching helps to do this. It's the relationships that activate those growth fibers in the brain that start coming together because of neuroplasticity, talking together in a new way. This facilitates self-regulation. If, if they don't have this healthy relationship and the coaching relationship is a good example to that, of that, we're not going to get these growth fibers. We're going to get the same brain pathways that we've always had. So coaching is such a nice opportunity um, for people to, to really, to literally grow like the connections um, and myelinate these brain pathways. And we know the more myelination they are, the faster that they work. Here's what else is interesting. Um, this not only reshapes the brain, integrates the different um, regions in the brain, um, develops new uh, coaching, also helps to develop new brain maps, but it, it um, impacts uh, gene expression as well. So depending on how, like the relationships that people are engaging in, if they're healthy or unhealthy, or, you know, if they're like socially rewarding for people, we can, we can turn on a health gene in one conversation. A health gene can be turned on in just a few minutes, upregulated. A health gene can also be downregulated. We see this with people who have high ACE scores, adverse childhood experiences. The epigenetically, which epigenetic means just above the gene, the genes don't dictate very much at all about our health. It's whether or not those genes get upregulated or downregulated and relationships play a big role in whether the health gene 
or the not so the the diabetes or the cancer gene gets upregulated or downregulated. So, uh, coaching can even play a role in people's physical health as well. However, none of this can happen without psychological safety. This is the foundation, the bedrock, the key ingredient, and we know from um, modern neuroscience from the literature that psychological and physical safety, they're the same. There is no difference. The human brain treats a threat to physical survival the same as it does to psychological. So if somebody, for example, feels ostracized, neglected, left out, if they don't feel very important, they're not significant, um, they don't feel like things are fair, there's no equity, they don't have a sense of certainty for their future. The, the brain actually tells them that there's a good chance they will die. So this is no different than if you get phys a physical blow to the head is no different than, so for example, a parent coming into the child welfare system is getting a pretty big blow because they're being told that you're not such a good parent. So we have to, um, we have to mitigate these and how do we help people feel important in their lives? Coaching is great for that because we're really putting the ball in their court as much as we can, as much as we can. There's, there's laws and legal issues that, that we have to pay attention to. And there's certain things that are non-negotiable, but how do we provide them more choice, more autonomy? So how do we calm down that limbic system and help them feel that, even though we, we separated the children from their home, that they know their child better than anybody else. They're the most important person, you know, on this care planning team, for example. And then most importantly, how do we bring emotion regulation to these interactions? How do we go about creating safety so that our clients can get into a physiological state at least for a temporary time, so that they can start growing those fibers that link the different, the differentiated regions of their brain. The more integrated their brain and their nervous system, the better choices they're gonna make when they walk away from that conversation with you and that you may be the only relationship that they have where they get the opportunity to do some integration. <clears throat> so, this is the essential ingredient here, really for both people in a coaching conversation or in a group. So what's, what's important here? We've got to learn how to regulate our nervous system. That's the first order of business. And then we can teach them these tools as well, emotion regulation tools. We've got to learn how to manage our primal response because they've been hanging out with people who haven't been managing their primal response very well and they didn't get an opportunity to grow those fibers. Coaching helps to do that. So as Buddha says, we ourselves must walk the path. This is not just for the folks that we serve. This is for us as well. And what, this, what I'm not talking about is a regular, it's really not a regulation strategy, um, but people use it as one, it's called suppression. And I'm sure that um, everybody in this, in, the, in, this, in this webinar uses this from time to time because I do too. I mean, we all do. We suppress how we feel. We keep a stiff upper lip. Upper lip. Sometimes um, people call this game face. Um, how like poker face. I'm not going to let my uh, direct report know how I really feel about their performance or, you know, a probation officer at a child and family team, you know, I'm going to suppress my feeling. We studies very clearly, lots of studies show when we suppress and stuff an emotion, we're not aware of it. We don't label it. We just tuck it away. Our blood pressure skyrockets, our cortisol levels go up, the amygdala flames up. We don't remember what happened, which is why we walk out of meetings not remembering conversations. And of course the prefrontal cortex, the lights kind of go out up there. What's really interesting is research shows that when we do that, it actually activates the same biological response in the other people in the room. So if you're a CFT facilitator and you're suppressing frustration and anger, you're gonna cause other people's blood pressure to go up 
and you're gonna cause their cortisol levels to raise and you're gonna cause their prefrontal cortex to shut down. And so then everybody gets dumb. <laughs> it just dumbs us down. So we really gotta be careful. This is a good tool to use if you're about to do something that could maybe get you in jail, <laughs> you know, or like hurt somebody. If it keeps you from hitting somebody, then suppress the emotion. But other than that, we really wanna move away as uh, from this, emo this regulation tool as much as we can. We're not perfect, we're gonna use it, right? but we use it too frequently um, and it is going it's related to chronic illnesses as well so everything's connected it's not, it's really all throughout the whole body and and the brain and the um and the other nervous systems i like what dr james gross at stanford university says he says that suppression is like secondhand smoke it's having the same effect if not worse on other people around you. So if you're having a coaching conversation, you're better off labeling and being aware of how you feel and maybe even helping other people label how they feel. In our society, we really have a tendency to steer away from emotions. Like we, and I'm sure many of you guys have heard, I, I know I have throughout my life, you know, leave your emotions outside the door. There's no place for those in this meeting that's not biologically possible. It actually, it's a great way for us to lose about 15 points in IQ. <laughs> we drop our IQ the more we try to just push emotions outside of a decision. The key here in emotion regulation is to be emotion informed, not emotion driven. Those are different things. How do we use our emotions intelligently and how do we manage ourselves intelligently as energy systems? So I have another polling question here, Nancy. You want to pull this one up? Yeah, so uh, let me get it started. We also have a question you bet. for you. So, I should have lost. Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay, there you go. Everybody can now um, log your answer. Did you see my additional third response, Lori? I do. <laughs> that could, that's, that's a good default. <laughs> Regular means most days. There you go. Almost every day. Really, it should be every day, but we're, I mean, you know, this is a human experience here. Nobody's perfect. And actually you, well, I'll, I'll unpack that statement a little bit more when we see the results. Okay. And it doesn't like have to look like this person on the screen either. <laughs> <laughs> it could look very different. Yeah. Oh, so now, 50... everybody, now everybody should be able to see. Wow. That 71% have some type of an emotion regulation technique that you use. And I'm guessing you said something other than game face, <laughs> something other than suppression, because we know that's going to actually deplete, deplete our inner battery. This is really good. This is very good, good news. And dep depends on what you mean by regularly. And that means, you know, you've got something that you, that you deliberately and you intentionally go to because you're aware of a, an emotion that is depleting you, such as, you know, uh, frustration, anger, worry, anxiety, you know, impatience, whatever that might be. Good. Hey, Lori. Yeah. So I'm um, just, uh, two things. So number one, um, uh, there may have been conflicting information on whether this webinar was um, 60 minutes or 90 minutes. Oh. So for those of you who need to log off, just know that we are um, recording it. So you can uh, check back on our website in about four or five days and we'll have it posted so you can watch the, um, the last um, however long you had to, to skip. So um, please know that we're recording it and that will be posted on our website. Thanks for joining us um, if, you, um, if, you, if you can't stay. And then the second one is I've got a question. Um, if much of what you're talking about if, uh, is similar to um, the concept be behind Hans. Uh-oh, I'm losing you, Nancy. 
Uh oh. Wait. Oh, Nancy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Hey, I love you. Okay. Hold on. Um. So okay. um, go ahead and when I, I if. Oh goodness. I. Um, yeah, you're coming in and out. I wonder what's happening. Okay. Um, Should I move forward and we come back? Hold on just a minute. You bet, you bet. Um, okay, I think you, can you hear me now? You sound great. Okay, and there's no echo? No. Awesome. Okay, so then the other thing is there was a question if this was similar to um, Hans um, Siley's gas theory, which is the general adaptation syndrome. And it's, it's about your body's response to stress. Yes, um, you are familiar with his theory. Yes, yes, I um, appreciate whoever brought that up. Um, so I, I love that that's um, kind of a brain map, a pathway that you connected to with this content here because it absolutely has to do with um, this. It's all about managing the stress response, you bet. Um, we've been talking a lot about kind of what's happening in the brain so far. We're gonna drop down into the body because there's an interconnected, um, like, you know, like interconnected highways that are going back and forth. And yes, they have to do with that stress response that you're talking about. So thank you for bringing that in. Um, <clears throat> I love this quote. This is Dr. Roland McCready. He's the director of research at the HeartMath Institute. And some of the findings that I'm integrating into this webinar today come from a lot of the work that they have done there. And a lot of published research in peer reviewed journals that I'm sharing with you. And he's kind of led some of that work. He says that failures of self-regulation are central to the vast majority of health and social problems. And this connects to what that caller was just saying um, about the stress response. The most important strength that the majority of people need to build is the capacity to self-regulate their emotions, attitudes, and behaviors. And you see what's first, emotions and attitudes, more important than anything because that's what usually drives the behavioral response. So <clears throat> Uh, let's um let's just kind of let's just keep un like unfolding this just a little bit this conversation about what's going on with our physiology and what this has to do with cultivating resilience so here's a study there's lots of studies like this this is just one example um <clears throat> where you see over to the left you've got two you've got a husband and a wife and they're they're seat belted into the car the wife is driving so a little bit more in the con in the in the control seat and this is a kind of a standard stress test. And they often try to use like in stress tests, something where people feel like they're like in a situation where they can't get out of it. So he's seat belted in the passenger side. And you can see over to the left here. Can you guys, Nancy, can you see my arrow on the screen as I'm pointing it over to the left? I sure can. Okay, good, great, good deal. Just making sure you guys can see that mouse. Okay, if you see over here to the left, you'll see He's got a heart monitor on. He's got a nice about 60 beats per minute heart rate, you know, doing pretty well, looks pretty nice. His wife says something that bothers him. Um, he doesn't like it. His heart rate shoots up to about, you know, maybe 90 or 100, something like that. The, an argument ensues. And look where his heart rate goes, All, about 140. Now, if you didn't, if I hadn't told you what was happening here, I'm guessing most of you would, if you looked at this heart rate, you would think, oh, maybe this guy stepped on a treadmill or an elliptical trainer or something like that. But no, he's sitting very, very still. And his heart rate went up, um, you know, qu quite, a, quite a few points there. That's about 80, 80 beats per minute and increased just from an argument. We see over here this red line. They make up right here, right where I'm pointing the mouse they figure it out, they're better, and they say all is all good. So they've, they've, um, they're in good shape. But look at his heart rate. It's still about 100 beats per minute. And it remains that, while, that, that way, even after all is well, for like a, a, like a couple of hours afterwards. So he thinks he's fine, but what keeps the score? The body. The body's always keeping the score. 
And that's what we see here. So if she, if he had to go have a really important conversation with his boss, so this is 60 minutes out, the heart rate still increased, we just can't see it. She drops him off at work and he's gotta have a performance about with his boss. He just took a big emotional blow in the emotional domain of resilience. So he took a hit. His energy was depleted right here. It's still being depleted. Might it impact the mental domain? His ability to focus, hear the feedback from his boss. Think about what he actually might wanna do with that feedback. This is what we see is that, that um, these emotional domains are taking big hits on our body. Why? Because emotions drive our physiology. They're way faster than thoughts. Thoughts move slower than emotions do. Even though we're having about 100,000 thoughts per day, we're having way more emotions. <clears throat> and they're driving what's happening in our physiology and they're driving whether or not we're able to, whoops, let me back that up. Sorry, I moved too quick there. They're, they're driving whether or not we are able to um, respond in a regenerative, resilient way to adversity or challenge in our, or just do some basic problem solving. So let's unpack this a little bit further. I'm gonna show you a quick video clip and then um, we'll, uh, actually I, I might do a poll after this just to see if anybody catches um, something in particular from the clip. So here we go. Maybe we'll just, we'll just take a, a quick poll there. Anybody wants to type into the chat window, if that's okay. Like anything that you noticed from that video. Anybody catch, for example, the caption at the end of the video. Let's we'll see what comes up there. Anything that you noticed from that video. <clears throat> So, so far we've got um, uh, uh, craziness to peaceful. The world is interpreted differently depending on emotional state. The music yes. was different, obviously. Um, um, music made it slower and peaceful. When triggered, everything was dangerous. The difference, um, initial music promoted uncertainty, fear. Second music produced feelings of calmness, felt scattered. Yeah. I love it. So really from uh, calm to clarity, from, you know, yeah, yeah chaos to peacefulness. Um, <clears throat> it was like a really state of dissonance versus resonance, you know, and, and, and from the beginning to or the first clip to the second clip. And I'm guessing that most people might have noticed that it was exactly the same visual data. The clip was exactly the same. Yeah, we got um, a couple of people have written just about how we interpret the interpretation. Yeah. Um, that we, we see the world. So I love this really nice guys, really, really great things that you picked up on there in that video. And we could say that it was the music that did it. We could just say, hey, it's just the music, just like they do in the movie theaters. It's the music that makes you have, you know, to, to change your perception. But if we really unfold that a little bit, it, it wasn't the music that shifted your perception. It was the emotional response. Because remember, emotions drive your physiology. So emotions are driving your perception. And I think somebody, somebody said that. 
So we can see the very, very same situation. So let's look at a, like a, if we're working with a family, it could be look exactly the same, but depending on how we feel, we could see it as dangerous and chaotic and unsafe. Or if we have a different emotional response going on, what's our soundtrack? What's going on in our background when we're working with that family or you know, with, a, with, a, with a partner, a system partner? we will see and perceive that very, very different. So it goes back to emotion regulation. What it's calling for, this wonderful, wonderful, challenging work that you're doing is calling for us to be able, and I would say just the times right now, even in our lives, all of us, is calling for the skills to choose our emotional diet. We've got to practice really good emotional hygiene. Otherwise, we're going to be driven by background music that we're not consciously aware of, and it's going to change the way that we perceive the world. And then that impacts our decisions and our choices, and they might not always be resilient. So this is also the work that we're doing with clients. So checking in on what's their emotional soundtrack when they come in, and then be staying regulated if they tell you that they're you know, really angry or they're really frustrated. Um, it's calling for us to do this. So what's the difference physiologically with these two emotional states? Well, in that first clip, you actually experienced a depletion. I'm sorry, but I activated the stress response. Um, you probably had a nice little burst of cortisol um, in your system when you watched that first video because it was pretty like... Um, kind of anxiety provoking, the way you guys described it was beautiful. When on the left, when we experience worry, frustration, anxiety, any of those, and I say depleting instead of negative, because we are, we're like batteries. When we experience those emotions, we get 1400 chemicals that get released into our bodies. And the key ingredient in that cocktail is cortisol. When we experience a renewing emotion, care, compassion, um, kindness, um, uh, love, appreciation, gratitude, any of those, um, joy, happiness, any of the, even just ease, just a sense of ease and calm, we get 1,400 chemicals released into our bodies, but they're different. And the key one that makes a big difference in uh, like our resilience capacity is called DHEA. That's kind of, it's the youth hormone, the vitality hormone. We don't want to be activating depleting emotions when we're trying to coach. And one cool thing about coaching is it, if we're in a regulated state, the coaching approach triggers renewing emotions for our clients most of the time. So we're already setting, we're, what, we, what we want to do is mitigate the stress response <clears throat> where these are all the kind of the things that are happening in the stress response. It doesn't go well with coaching. So we can't come to a client where we've got all of these chemicals and cortisol going on in our system. It would be like coming to a client and we've been drinking. We wouldn't do that. So what's happening here? Well, if we look at the autonomic nervous system, we see two different branches. The sympathetic, now we're dropping down into the body here, and the parasympathetic. Parasympathetic puts the brakes on. Sympathetic speeds things up, increases heart rate. Both of these two branches of the nervous system are important for regulation. Sympathetic's associated with fight, flight, or freeze. Parasympathetic, rest, digest, and repair. Where are your clients coming in? What kind of activation? Sympathetic, right? Where are we often in a, in a system, you know, with high pressure that you guys are working in? Sympathetic. Where's all of society most of the time? Sympathetic. We're not getting much rest and repair. Well, here's what's interesting. I'll back up real quick. Um, these two branches of the nervous system intersect at the heart. And then the heart plays a big role. And I don't mean this from a, like a kumbaya perspective. I'm really talking about the heart from a scientific perspective. The heart plays a role in how well the prefrontal cortex engages in a conversation or 
in a care plan, in a change, in a, in a, in a, in a, or in a strategic plan to move change forward in an organization. What's going on here? Most people think that the brain, the cranial brain in the head is the command center. And you, it, it plays a pretty big role. We really want the, you know, the brain. The brain is a big player in how well we manage our lives. No question about that. If it's not working well, we're not doing well. But the brain communicates with the heart. And most people don't know this far more than the brain communicates with the heart. So the heart communicates with the brain. 90% of the community, about 85 to 90% of the communication between the heart and the brain is happening from the heart up to the brain. There is, this is from the field of neurocardiology, there is a brain that's located within our heart. And I literally mean a brain. It's called the intrinsic cardiac system. It has neurons, short and long-term memory, it produces just as much oxytocin as the brain in the skull does. It produces norepinephrine. Um, it's pretty much, it thinks. And the brain is, auto, or the heart is autorhythmic. It'll beat on its own. The source of the beat of the heart is coming from within. Whereas the brain cannot continue without the heart. What's this got to do with resilience? It's sending signals up through something called the vagus nerve. So when we're working with people in a coaching engagement, we're actually activating something called vagal tone. If we can soothe their nervous system and we can keep our nervous system soothed when we do it. <clears throat> and there's <clears throat> a lot going on with the vagus nerve. We don't have time to really unpack it. But it goes, it, it really runs from, it's a, it's, it's a cranial nerve that's from the brain. So it's really all the way from the top to, um, to our colon. So it is a uh, pathway that, it, that wanders throughout the body, in vagus meaning wandering, um, it, in Latin. It wanders throughout the body and it connects up the three brains that play a role in how resilient we are in any given moment. And the three brains are the cranial brain, of course we got a brain in the heart, and then many of you may know that the enteric nervous system, the gut, that brain produces more serotonin than the brain in our skull. Most of it is managed there. What I'm talking about here is if we don't activate the social engagement system, and this is really, um, coming from the vagus nerve, from the heart up to the brain. This is the mammalian caregiving system. And we see people who have had trauma, they've got low vagal tone. The caregiving system has shut down. Part of the reason is because they haven't experienced it. In coaching, if we can activate this social engagement system, this caregiving system, even with clients who might be bringing challenging situations or maybe with you know, staff that do, this will set the physiology, it'll put the physiology into a state where it will light up the, the frontal regions of the brain. So how does it do that? Through something called coherence. And this is a scientific term, it's been studied quite a bit. This is a state where all of the systems are working together. So we're not just talking about, hey, we got the frontal lobe lit up. We're talking about the autonomic nervous system, the two branches, they're working in order, in synchrony, and in harmony. And then the heart, because there is order in the system, it sends a message up the vagus nerve and it tells the prefrontal cortex to light up, to be able to solve problems, to hear an alternative perspective. It soothes the limbic system. But if we're not creating this psychological safety, we're not in a state of coherence. Coherence is interesting. We could do a whole workshop on coherence, but I just want to introduce it to you here today. It is, coherence is a term you'll find in all, like, Biology, biology, quantum physics. It's really the defining quality of all living systems. It is, it's a state where things work in harmony. They're working in agreement with each other and things are in order. 
This is the state that we want our bodies in when we're coaching. Otherwise, if we're in a state of incoherence, a signal gets sent up to the brain that tells the smoke alarm, the amygdala to go off. And then we're in fight, flight, or freeze. So this heart, the brain and the heart plays a big role in how smart we are in any given situation. What's going on? Well, this is, a, this is actually a signal that's been measured. This is the same person. And this is a signal that's going up through the vagus nerve from the heart, from the two branches of the autonomic nervous system. And the top signal is the measurement of frustration. If we had anger, we would see a little bit of a different footprint. All emotions have a different footprint that go from the heart to the brain. Down on the bottom, we see the emotion of appreciation. Notice the coherence, the flow in that pattern. That pattern on the bottom lights up the prefrontal cortex. It keeps people from going over to that habit region of the brain and it allows people to um, create the integrative fibers that lead to stress resilience capacity. So this is measured. When we have these feelings of frustration, not only are we depleting, but we're shutting down the higher regions of the brain. So we can't come, this on the left here, that feeling of frustration, if we're coming with a, a, the client with, with this feeling and we're suppressing it, this is shutting down our capacity to have a coaching conversation. And of course, they're probably coming in to the system with the frustration. We want to shift them to appreciation by meeting those needs I talked about earlier, helping them to feel important, giving them choices, teaching them self-regulation techniques, having them take a breath um, before they move into a planning conversation. So what we see is that the rhythm that is activated, this is all happening below conscious awareness in the autonomic nervous system is sending signals up to the brain and having pretty big impacts on our intelligence levels. How aware we are, our ability to self-regulate, make decisions. I love this quote by biologists. This fascinating quote to me, Dr. May Wan Ho. She says that if you have a fully quantum, basically a coherent system, you will never age and you will never die. But we do age and we do die. That's because of incoherence of some degree. Now, obviously we can't be coherent all the time, but could we bring a little bit more of this into our engagements in, in the system? Because the, there's a, a, just a plethora of research that links physiological coherence in our nervous system to well-being and stress resilience, as well as even treatment, even activating states of coherence um, I'm going to teach you a tool we're going to get to here. I'll have to move kind of quick uh, technique that is an evidence-based practice in the SAMHSA registry for children who have ADD because it helps us to light, to really grow the gray matter in the frontal lobe. So what we're talking about here is getting in sync as coaches, as case managers, as leaders, as supervisors, activating that social engagement caregiving system. If we don't do that, we don't have safety and we don't have new brain maps and we don't, we're not gonna cultivate resilience. So we gotta pay attention to what our heart is doing. That's why I ask you, do you have some type of regulation tool? And you probably have some that you might not have even be consciously aware of, like just reframing, even seeing things differently. We gotta pay attention to, are we losing our coherence throughout the day? And so something I use this, I practice coherence every day. I did it this morning. I do at least 15, try to do, try to do at least 15 minutes a day. I actually have a device. You can measure your coherence on a biofeedback device. This is a very real state where you could have your clients measure it. Why is this important? Because it doesn't just stay within our bodies. The heart, actually, the electricity of the heart, and this is not an aura, this is a measurable biomagnetic field, it comes out from our bodies 10 feet in a toric shape around our bodies. And we have measured within this field a frequency 
and that frequency changes depending on what we think and what we feel. So scientists can actually um, tell somebody how they're feeling within a 75% accuracy, but never talking to them or seeing them just by measuring the electricity that's coming out around their body. The brain only comes out an inch. Uh, the heart uh, produces 5,000 times more magnetic energy than the brain does. So we are, we are linked. We are neurophysiologically linked. We can't separate ourselves. We're not in a separate little suit here by ourselves. We know this from some of the um, findings in mirror neurons that emotions are contagious. We know suppression is contagious. So our emotion regulation plays a big role in how well we can coach a client. And of course they're impacting us too, which is why we need those tools and those techniques. So learning how to control your inner being by mastering your physiology is how you cultivate resilience in yourself. Clients will mirror you. We measure this. They will mirror self-regulation. It's called co-regulation. This cultivates resilience. Coaching is a form of co-regulation, a powerful form. So we have, we're just going to take a really like short minute. I'm going to teach you guys a tool. This is something I use every day. This has been scientifically um, used, measured. It's used by elite athletes. It's used by um, it's used by military. It's used by surgeons before they go into the surgical room. This is a well-researched tool that if you practice this tool on a daily basis, it'll actually increase um, the resilience capacity in your nervous system. And I encourage you, if you're comfortable, to teach it to your clients. I'll guide you. We're going to breathe through the heart. I'll tell you what to do in a minute. That's the first step. And then I'm going to ask you to see if you can feel a positive emotion. A good one is gratitude or appreciation. So let's all, if everybody's ready, and it, you obviously if you don't want to participate, you don't have to. But if you like, get yourself into a comfortable position. If you want, you can put your feet flat on the floor or however feels good to you. Maybe kind of sit in a dignified posture. Soften your shoulders, loosen your jaw, maybe smooth out your forehead. Start bringing your awareness to the area of your heart or the center of your chest. When you do that, it starts shifting the physiology in your nervous system. Keep your awareness on the area of your heart or the center of your chest and imagine that your breath is flowing in through the heart area and it's flowing out through the heart area. Your mind's already wondered. You've been thinking about how long you've been on the webinar, emails that are coming in, texts. What's this coherent stuff Lori's telling me about? Every time it does that, just keep returning it back to the center of your chest and your breath. And keep feeling the breath coming in and out of the heart area. And now you're gonna choose an emotion. You're gonna activate a feeling, maybe of gratitude, love, care, compassion, kindness, honor, dignity. A feeling you have associated with a special time in your life, a special place, someone that you care about, a pet, maybe a time when you accomplished something, or just a feeling of ease, maybe that feeling you have when you walk out on a beautiful spring or fall morning. Really feel it as you breathe in and out of the chest area, right in the heart area. And when you're ready, you can just bring your awareness back to the webinar. That technique, which might seem deceptively simple, if you practice that on a daily basis, it will increase the elasticity in the two branches of your autonomic nervous system, and you will increase your resilience capacity. So will your team members and so will your clients. I have companies and teams that are practicing this throughout the organization because it's evidence-based.
a nice, simple, easy tool that you can practice that is scientifically validated. And I'm sure you guys may have some questions. I know we're really at the time here. I'll end with a quote and then if, there, if people want to hang on for questions. I love this quote by William James, the father of psychology. He says, the great thing then in all education is to make our nervous system our ally instead of our enemy. And I think that's one thing that we do with a coaching approach. And of course, what's important there is we're making our own nervous systems our allies as well and modeling that for our clients. Thank you guys. I kind of jam packed a lot of information in there, but I'm available for any questions if anybody, if you've got some there, Nancy, or anybody wants to stay in the, on the line. Okay, I don't have any questions right now. Um, I did um, post that our next webinar is on June 5th at 10 o'clock, um, Connecting the Dots, um, Critical Thinking, um, Coaching and Supervision. Uh, the website is listed in the chat window. And um, Lori, we just really, really appreciate you and um, your time. Uh, and everybody who um, joined our webinar today, we hope to see you um, virtually in a month. And then um, in one year, almost exactly from today, a little bit less than one year from today, we'll see you in Davis, California for the National Conference on Coaching and Human Services. Um, all of the previous webinars are posted on our website. You can just Google Northern California Training Academy um, UC Davis or Training Academy UC Davis. Um, and you, you'll find um, there's a box that says uh, our coaching webinars and you'll, you'll see the following links. And um, the, this uh, video will be posted. It generally takes us about four or five days to post this. So we've got a question um, uh, if we're going to send this out. Um, we are hoping to send out a link of, all, of everything to everybody in the next week or so. Um, but you can just go to our website and find it there. Um, and then we've got a question that says, um, we've got a couple of questions. So for those of you who would like to stay, we'll answer some of these questions. Um, for those who need to go, um, we hope to see you in a month. So the first question is, what is the tool or app that you use to measure your own biofeedback? Oh, yeah. Okay. So let me... I use, and I'll even show it to you. You're kind of quiet, Lori. Can you maybe talk a little bit louder right there? Oh, yeah, yeah, you bet. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Can you see me too? Totally. Cool, yeah. This is something called an inner balance. There's other things that, you know, you can use. This actually, I, I'm looking at my heart rate variability with this, which has a lot to do with resilience. We didn't get into that. We didn't have time. Um, but this will measure your coherence levels. And I practice coherence pretty much every day on this. I just clip it on my shirt, clip it on my ear, and it lets me know if I'm sending that um, incoherent signal or coherent signal from my heart to my brain and whether or not I'm lighting up my frontal lobe <laughs> or not. So this is called an inner balance. You can get one through the HeartMath Institute. You can get them on Amazon. Um, there's also like, and you can see like I just use it on my phone. I'll just show you here. Like you can see like this is a, a little short practice that I did. You can see like the signal that I was pretty, maybe you can't see it there, but it's nice and smooth. That's what we want. Um, so it's a great way to check in on you. You don't have to have that to practice this tool. You can practice absolutely without it, but it's a nice way to kind of peer in, check in on your nervous system. There's also another device that's called an M-Wave. A lot of practitioners use that with clients. Um, that one's a little bit more, um, there's a little bit more options on that one. Um, it's called, so EM, W A V E. It's called an M wave. And it's just a little device too, hooks up to your computer. There's games on there. Um, you can check your coherence levels there too. That one's a little, both of them are very reasonably priced for just like portable biofeedback devices. So that, those are the ones that I use. And you can, obviously there's other ones that you could, but I- Awesome, thanks Lori. So, um, uh, and then we've got another question, um, but somebody, um, Rebecca, not somebody, Rebecca would, is asking if you could put the slide back up with um, the Buddha quote. Oh. If you can maybe find that one, we could end with a Buddha quote. Um, and then um, while you're looking for this, um, I'm going to ask 
L. Joanna for a little bit more information. She's asking, what are some research or examples on how we can do some techniques in organizations, especially in child abuse hotline or call centers? And I'm wondering um, uh, what um, research or examples on, on how to do what in organizations. Um, but Lori, do you, uh, um, Lori, what do you think? Yeah, I'd like to hear, like, I would love for her to kind of, um, like, peel back another layer on that question and help me understand. So I think she might be saying, how, how do you integrate these tools into organizations? Yeah, I, I think probably um, maybe just all of it in organizations, which um, we are absolutely um, in support of <laughs> using this in um, organizations, especially in child abuse hotlines or call centers. So, um, Lori, do you have some thoughts on that? Yeah, I've actually trained call centers um, on, on this technique. So there, there is a way you, you can... Um, there's a workshop where you can learn. This was a really quick, you know, and I condensed version and I had other stuff in this one, but there, you can do a workshop on understanding the, the physiology um, or kind of the neurosomatic approach to cultivating resilience capacity. So there's a, you can provide the education um, and some organizations, so they will, they will have a trainer come in, provide the education, and so they train everybody on it, or maybe they just train, maybe it's the leadership staff, or maybe it's just the whole call center, or whatever. Um, and then you can, you like, people can purchase the devices if they want biofeedback, not necessary. I'm a biohacker, I'm always playing around with technology, but that's not necessary, but some people will use those. I've had some organizations where they, um, they, they are, they want, they'll just put like a little coherence stand, like a little pod, and they'll have like, a device in there where people can just kind of drop by, check in on their nervous system, see how they're doing, practice the techniques. These are on the go. You can practice them anywhere in the elevator, in between the calls at the call center. The key is really, you know, getting yourself into that physiological state so that you can respond in a resilient way. And oftentimes, like, we don't mean to do it. It's unintended. We don't even know we're, that we're, like, not in that state to respond. And then, of course, we say something or we do something that's not helpful sometimes, right? Um, so, yes, you, there's training that you can um, bring into your organization. I mean, I'm happy to, to talk more about that if somebody wants to reach out or reach out to you, Nancy, and I can give you the information. Yeah, and um, she did follow up, so thanks, um, um, L, Joanna, Joanna, <laughs> and Joanna. Um, the, um, she clarified, it's, which you just answered, is techniques or activities to build resiliency, um, but then added, and I think this is something that everybody in child welfare feels, is that there's, you know, which, particularly in, um, call centers, the strict schedules and limited time and and how do you how do you work this into your day? And we hear that a lot in child welfare jurisdictions around. Um, it's the same with coaching. No, we don't have time to do these things. And um, I think we can look and see the levels of stress and well-being of staff. And we ha have to look hard and say, we can continue to do what we're doing and um, and have very stressed people <laughs> or we need to do things differently. Yeah. And it's uh, every agency has to make that decision that they have to do things differently. Yeah. So and here's what's going on. Um, when we're in a state of depletion and dysregulation, everything's taking way longer. So it does feel like we don't have any time. When we switched into an optimal state of performance, which is coherence, that's when a meeting takes 30 minutes instead of 90 minutes. That's when an email takes you five minutes instead of 20 or, you know, having to like repair the damage from an email that you didn't, you know, you just weren't, you didn't even realize, but you, you know, what you said was not really the best way to say it. So when we start working with more fuel efficiency and, and like really learning how to manage ourselves intelligently, then we, we're, we're just, we're like performing better. And then there is more time. And the good thing about like tools like the one that I just showed you is you don't, ha I do, I try to do a 15 minute coherence practice as much as I can. I'm not perfect every day. I try to, but what's really more important is doing these on the go. 
So I teach a lot. I do them when I'm standing in front of the classroom teaching. Nancy, you've seen me facilitate a workshop before. I was using this practice. You didn't know it. I was practicing it. I practiced it before the workshop and I practice it throughout the workshop. You, once you keep, you like basically you're building the, you're rewiring your nervous system so you can change your physiology on the go, like as you're walking around. Are you gonna do that the first few times you practice it? No, it's like you know, choosing your emotional diet and practicing good emotional hygiene is, it's not, it doesn't happen in one day. It does take a little bit of time to practice it, but you'll notice big gains in a pretty short period of time. It is um, wild, Lori, how, so I um, started meditating um, a formal practice about a year ago and I'm, um, I, I did it pretty daily for about seven months and then I took about three months off because I decided I just, I just didn't have time for it. And you know, life gets busy and stressful. And then I realized, oh wow, I really need that. And I have come back to now meditating for the last two months. And it is amazing how much better I feel. And it is so hard to make the time for it. I mean, it is, it is not an easy conundrum. Yeah. And especially when you're stressed, you don't feel like you have time for it, you know? Yeah, yeah. that is the problem. The more like that the sympathetic nervous system is being activated, the more we will perceive that there's just no, I've got stuff to do. I've got paperwork right. to take care of, right? So um, like I, I just practice even, I, I was doing this even like during the workshop, I often will just, because I've been doing this for a while, do heart focused breathing. I did a two minute practice before this webinar started because I'm here to be in service for you guys and to help you make your lives easier. And so I want to be in a coherent state. I took two minutes before the webinar to do it. Um, so in between those phone calls, for example, even just taking a few, taking one breath and doing it. Um, if you take a breath, if you, if you take one breath and let's say, and you breathe in for five seconds and you breathe out on the exhale and you just extend it a little longer, maybe six or seven seconds, you will activate vagal tone. Just mm -hmm. that one. People have time for that. They do. They yeah. have time for one. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Okay. So we've got, we've got two more questions and thank you all. We still have 39 people on the call. So, um, we've got one. Can you recommend resources? We've had, I'll tell you both questions. Um, can you recommend resources for understanding the heart pattern and coherence relation better? And then, um, do you recommend a morning type pep talk or meditation with staff before shifts start? I do recommend prepping your day with some something, some, some type of um, regulation practice uh, and you know there's a lot you could do if you want to use music do it with music to change the physiological state but sh shift your physiology into a more intelligent space we do recommend that and that might be just we, if we all do the one breath we breathe in five seconds and we breathe out seven and activate vagal tone or maybe, we, maybe you teach them you can teach them coherence breathing um, you can teach them how to do that as well. So yes, I think that's a great way to go. And then check, you know, we need to be checking in more on other people too, you know, like really noticing what's going on with their nervous systems and paying attention even to our tone, like, because our tone can either, um, shut down the social engagement system, like decrease vagal tone. And um, it, there's actually different branches of the vagus nerve. We didn't have time to unpack that. But um, we, there's things that we can do that will shut down the mammalian caregiving system and we don't mean to. So really self-assessing even throughout the day and checking in on other people can be helpful too, just to see how they're doing. You really almost have to start shifting your language and being aware that, wow, we're like we're in the business of like managing nervous systems here in a lot of ways because we're trying to create you know positive change and it requires that so the second thing was was it resources um yep yes, there are a lot of resources you know one good place to learn about the connection that dialogue between the heart and the brain which i know is so fascinating is to go the the, the heart math institute has, go to their research section, tons of research published in peer review journals. And you can, you know, that's a really good place to start um, to learn about that, that, that communication. 
the um, Stephen Porges, the polyvagal theory. Uh, so Stephen and his last name P O R G E S. He's doing some. He's been for a couple of decades now. You can learn a lot about that connection too um, by reading about the polyvagal theory. Um, so those are two. I mean, man, you could. That's like you. You got. You got a lot to sift through right there with those two resources. And I'm just looking up right now the. Um, oh, I don't know what I. It, it just took it off the name. The heart math. That little doohickey thingy that you showed. <laughs> oh, you see it? This thing, my little inner balance. Yeah, your inner balance. I just inner balance. Yep, I just looked it up. <laughs> yep. Yes, I, I I I love this thing. I use it quite a bit. And there's, you know, I told you that they also have the the one that's uh, that hooks to the computer. I like this one. It's more portable. It's easy. It does the job. I also have an M wave. I have both of them. Yeah. I just like my inner balance, and it shows up on my phone, and I, I travel, so it's you know. It's, 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 and they have specials, so look for sales and specials, but actually it's priced pretty reasonable for, an, you know, a little in-home biofeedback device. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, thank you. That does it for the questions. So um, here, I'll turn on my video so I can wave goodbye to everybody. Oh, um, actually, I'm not, we're, I'm gonna turn on a video, hold on. So yeah, you're turn off there. <laughs> Well, I don't know if you'll be able, I don't know. I'm not getting the video figured out. Anyway, I'm waving goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Talk to you in a month. Bye.